We begin a new sermon series today uh, on a change of attitude, and we're going to look at Philippians 4 for the next three weeks. So I'd like for you to listen now as we hear the scripture read this morning. Today's scripture is Philippians 4, 4 through 7. You can follow along in the inside and out insert in your bulletin as I read. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Gracious God, open us up today. Open our eyes that we might see and our ears that we might hear. Open our hearts that we might feel. And then, O Lord, open our hands that we might serve. Amen. I want to begin today by telling you about two people that I know. Uh, The first is a man named Tom. It is not me, uh, not a member of our church. Don't look around you, Uh, trying to pinpoint him. Uh, Tom is a remarkable guy. He is always um, full of joy. Every time I meet him, how are you doing? Terrific. And I always think, you know, it can't be that terrific all the time. I mean, maybe today you're terrific, but you weren't terrific last time. I, I just know because I, I know some of the things going on in his life. I know some of the challenges he's faced. But there's just a joy inside him that I sure wish I had. I want to have. I long for. Uh, let me tell you about another man. This uh, man has recently joined our church. He has been in a struggle with cancer over a number of years. Uh, Joined our church, uh, Sunday school class, wonderful guy. He's not always full of that same joy in the sense that I, you know, when you see him, you don't think, oh, what an upbeat guy he is. But he's a nice guy. He reminds me more of me. And, you know, I, uh, I was talking to him this week. Um, he called me. I returned his call. And in the midst of the conversation, he, uh, I asked him about his health. And he said, you know, my cancer's in remission. Things are good. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm staying after it. And, um, and then he, I said, well, how are your spirits? And he said that he, these words, uh, they really just, maybe it's because I was working on this sermon, they jumped out at me, but they really, he said, I have decided that you can be miserable and make everyone around you miserable, or you can live the life that you have been given as it is. It was the first three words that jumped out at me. I have decided. Right? There is a sense in which we, um, we have a decision to make about how we will deal with the world around us. I don't know what your life will bring, but you have a decision to make about how you will deal with it. I I want to talk over the next three weeks about attitude. And I believe that in Philippians 4, the fourth chapter of Philippians, there is much of what we can learn about our attitudes just in that chapter. I'm going to read Philippians 4 every single morning from the beginning of it to the end of it. It's not that long. It'll take me about three minutes. For the next three weeks, I'm going to read it every day, every single morning. I want to challenge you to do the same thing and to let it remind you of what the the practices we're trying to focus on and a, a decision about how you're going to live your life. Uh, Our our sermon series could be summed up in the words of the great prophet, Patti LaBelle, who who said, I'm feeling good from my head to my shoes. I I know where I'm going and what I got to do. I'm tidied up my point of view. I've got a new attitude. Uh, I I, I, I was looking for Patti LaBelle here today. I, I should have, I didn't think of that until this morning in the shower, or I'm confident they would have uh, been willing to sing it for us. 
I've got a new attitude. So let's look at the scripture and see what it teaches us. Let's just jump right in. You've got it in front of you. I hope you'll look with me. First, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, I began what I was saying by saying that I wish I had what my friend Tom has, this, uh, this joy inside him. And I, I implied that it was something you've got, but that's not what we see in Scripture. It is listed here as a verb, rejoice. It's, it's something you do. It's not something you get, like you can hold it, but it's something you do. It's something you practice. It's a discipline of your life. It's a habit you engage in. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice always. Not in good times or bad times. No, not in only good times and not in bad times, but in good times or bad times. Rejoice always. Now let me make a couple of disclaimers right up front. First, I'm not, uh, I'm not talking about clinical depression. And I'm not talking about anxiety disorders. These are uh, clinical pathologies. They are diseases. They are chemical changes in the brain. Um, they're real. They're powerful. Um, if you're struggling with clinical depression, you're not going to be able to practice your way out of it or smile your way out of it or grit your teeth your way out of it or read your Bible the way out of it. Uh, you, you know, people will come and talk to me about depression and I'll say, you need to go see a therapist and you need to see a physician. There are antidepressants you can take that can make a difference in your life. I've been on antidepressants uh, as I faced clinical depression. You, you're not going to be able to just, just sort of, you know, uh, Bible your way out of that. That's a disease, and God gave us amazing resources for dealing with those. Uh, what I'm talking about is something different. I'm talking about this, this sense we have where we ride this roller coaster of emotions all the time, where we, we go, when things are not going well, we're really down, and then we're really up, and then we're really down, and then we're down, and we're, we just, it's like we're connected, and, and all of our happiness, all of our all of our joy is all tied into to the circumstances of the things that are going on in our lives. And, and uh, we need to train ourselves that that isn't what we do. We don't focus on what's going on in our lives as the up and downs, but there's, there's something deeper that gives us joy in which we rejoice. Viktor Frankl was, um, uh, you know, one of, one of the books that I would recommend everybody read, it's probably on my top five, is a book by Viktor Frankl who was a therapist and was in the Nazi concentration camps and the book is called Man's Search for Meaning and in it he makes this simple observation. He, he talks about what he saw in the camps and he said, they can take away all of our freedoms except the last human freedom the freedom to determine one's own attitude in any circumstance, the freedom to choose one's own way. We can, I have decided how I want to react to the world around me. Now, I'm not saying that you never get sad or that you never um, ha have uh, uh, bad days or that bad things don't happen to you. In fact, those emotions are all God given to us. Uh, there's a difference, though, between joy and happiness. Joy is this deep sense of being connected to a source of life that isn't out there, but is up there and in here. Right? It's something different than just being happy. And joy is something that we can have. We're going to sing at the end, uh, rejoice, 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 give thanks and sing. And we say, in gladness and in woe, we rejoice. Rejoice always. So that leads us to the second component, rejoice in the Lord. There are two, there are two words that we use in the English language that have to do with joy. Um, in the Greek language, the New Testament's written in Greek, they are, they're completely different words. One of the words is enjoy, 
And enjoy has to do with the world around us, what, what's going on in our lives, right? Um, it, we enjoy a good steak. We enjoy a chicken fried steak with cream gravy, salt. We, we enjoy pecan pie with ice cream. We enjoy banana pudding. Oh, I love banana pudding. <laughs> See, enjoy has to do with the world around us. Rejoice is a different word. In, in the Greek, it, the word is kairo, and it, it means it's the same word as um, charis, which means grace, or charisma, which means gift. Rejoice comes from that word. It, it has to do with this experience of, of the presence of God in our lives. So enjoy is a, those of you who are grammarians, enjoy is a transitive verb, meaning it has a direct object. You enjoy something. Rejoice is an intransitive verb. It has an indirect object. You don't rejoice something. You rejoice with something or someone. You re so we, Paul says later in, in Romans 5, Paul says, so we rejoice in our sufferings. Paul doesn't say, so we enjoy our sufferings. It's not that the sufferings are good things for us. It's we rejoice in the midst of them. We rejoice in the midst of our sufferings. So if indeed rejoice is an intransitive, well, I want to use, here's the image that I want to use because I think it's the best picture I can give. And I use it with some fear and trepidation. It's the, it's the image of marriage. And I want to use it not as a way of saying this is what marriage ought to be like, Although that's a, that's a different sermon. This is, a, this, is a, uh, this is how the scripture uses marriage as the, as the parallel, the model for what our relationship with God is supposed to be like. Paul talks about that. He says we are to love, we love one another the way, in marriage the way Christ loves the church. There is a, there is a parallel between Christ and the church and, hu and husbands and wives loving each other. So... <clears throat> Have you ever noticed that when you have a wedding ceremony, there is such a focus on uh, the, the, the things that are ahead? So we say, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. Why do we say that? Because <laughs> we know that's what's ahead, right? We know that there's going to be good times and there's going to be bad times, and that's life. So what we're saying in marriage is, I've got you, you've got me, and side by side, we're going to face these things that come at us. We're, we're, we can handle these together. And, and the joy that we have is not going to be in those things. The joy that we have is in one another, in the midst of this life that's coming our way. So that's the image I want you to hang on to when you say rejoice in the Lord. It's not, I'm rejoicing because life is wonderful and everything's good. I'm rejoicing because I have this relationship with God that nothing can separate me from. You know, in marriage, there is a caveat, isn't there? At the very end of the, the um, vow, we say, till death do us part. And there will be a time that death parts people. And the sadness, the, the brokenheartedness is going to be there. <laughs> but we don't say that in our relationship with Jesus. In fact, we say exactly the opposite. Romans 8, perhaps the most famous passage in Scripture. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ and from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing will separate us. I can handle anything that comes my way. Not, I can handle death. I can handle life. I can handle uh, wonderful things. I can handle terrible things because... I have that relationship with you, O oh Lord. And, in the, and it's in that relationship that I will rejoice. 
you might have noted that the cross has two pieces, right? An up and down piece, a vertical piece, and a horizontal piece. And we've talked about that a lot. You know, the up and down piece is our relationship with God, and the horizontal piece is, is our relationship with others. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. But here's what I want you to notice. It's the vertical piece that holds up the horizontal piece. If you don't have, if, if the vertical piece isn't stable, the horizontal piece is going to shake. So what we do is in the midst of life, of this roller coaster of life, we tie ourselves to something that doesn't go like this. We tie ourselves to something that's solid, that not even death can take away. And in that we will rejoice. Well, Paul doesn't pretend that there are no problems. He says, do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. So what are the challenges that could pull us apart? Well, anything and everything, right? Those are the things that could get in the way. Uh, he gives, you know, if you look at and read through Philippians, you'll see some examples as he's giving some exhortations to the church there. Um, he begins the, the chapter, I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Conflict. Conflict will turn your head away from that relationship and distract you and keep you from rejoicing. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel. Exhaustion, isolation, loneliness. Uh, near the end of the chapter, you Philippians indeed know that in the early days of the gospel when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving. Financial trouble, personal need, debt collectors, anything and everything can turn our heads if we're not careful. In fact, sometimes it's nothing. Somebody was telling me the other day that the difference between fear and anxiety is that fear is of something that's actually there, and anxiety is of something that only might be there. May come, may not. I don't know if that's the official definition, but it makes sense to me. Sometimes I've been anxious, and I can't even, I don't even know what I'm anxious about. You get up in the morning, you got that feeling in the pit of your stomach, and you're like, I don't, I don't even know what that is. I'm not, I don't know, what am I scared of? Anything and everything, and sometimes it's nothing. So what do we do with all that that'll turn our heads? In anything and everything, make your requests in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving known to God. Remember, prayer, prayer's purpose is not to make what we want have happen happen, but to build our relationship with Christ. Intimacy with God in Christ is the purpose of prayer. Just like when I talk to my wife, it's not to get what I want. When I talk to my wife, it's to build relationship. Right? That's why we talk. That's why you, you visit with one another, is because in that talking, we build relationship. When we talk to God, it's not to, to make God do what we want God to do. We're smarter than that. No, we do it because we want to have that intimacy. If I can have that intimacy with God, then whatever comes my way, I believe I can handle. Now, look what happens when many of you have faced stressful situations and you may have, a, and, and they're putting pressure on your family, and what you find is that you're being pulled apart. What do you need to do? Well, you need to focus on that, getting that relationship stronger so together you can handle it. When, when these incredible stressors come our way, we'll, we may find our relationship with God beginning to, to, um, to falter. What do we do? In prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, we pray. We pray. 
We build that relationship stronger and stronger so that we can rejoice in every circumstance. Not happy in every circumstance, you can be deeply sad, you can grieve with a broken heart, but there is still that realization that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That, that's the, the vertical pillar. So what's the payoff? Well, the payoff is, Scripture says, and the God of peace will be with you. I loved one translation I read. You will have peace that, no, let's see, uh, and God's peace that don't make no sense will be with you. <laughs> that even though logic would tell you in the midst of this storm, you should be a mess, there'll be a centeredness. Dr. Amy Simpson, who's pastor at Riverside Church in New York City, pointed me to a, uh, a podcast of This American Life from last July. And in it, she tells this amazing story. Uh, the, it's not a she, it's a he in This American Life. Tells this amazing story about um, the Second World War. Just uh, So before the, the Second World War um, began for the United States, Japan had invaded Manchuria, which is part of, of China. And uh, as soon as Pearl Harbor happened, the day after Pearl Harbor, um, the soldiers came into a school in, um, in China, in Manchuria, that was uh, a school for mostly the children of missionaries that were there, Christian missionaries. And um, uh, they were from all over the world, the United States and Belgium and Canada. And, and they all were in China and their kids were going to school there. Most of them were girls. I think there was a boys' school someplace else. This was co-ed, but the vast majority were girls. They, uh, took, they captured all of them and all of their teachers. Their parents were captured and taken someplace else, but they were all taken to a prison camp. They were um, um, in a prison camp for four years throughout the Second World War until they were liberated. Uh, they were there for part of the time, and then they were taken to a place called Wellhausen, which is a, 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 even a worse, it's actually a concentration camp where they were taken. These children were along with their teachers. Now, many of the children were part of uh, an organization of girls called Girl Guides, I guess the predecessor of Girl Scouts. And the Girl Guides, um, the leaders of the Girl Guides were called Brown Owls, which I don't know why I find that so funny. I just imagine that. They're the, you know, they, I can imagine their owl outfits as they are uh, leading these uh, Girl Guides. Now, here's the motto of Girl Guides. A Girl Guide smiles and sings under any difficulties. So the teachers decided that they could still do Girl Guides in a, Chinese, in a Japanese prison camp. And they did. And they sang, and they prayed, and they did all of those things. They interviewed uh, this one woman who's 84 who had been there in the prison camp. And at least at the time she was interviewed, she was 84. And I want to read to you what she said, because this, I, just, I don't know, this just grabbed me. Mary Previte is her name. She was one of the girls. She said, so you're eating some, some kind of glop made out of maybe boiled animal grain, broom corn, that the Chinese feed to their animals was often what the Japanese fed us. And you're eating it out of a soap dish or a tin can. And here comes Miss Stark behind you, one of the brown owls. And she says, Mary Taylor, do not slouch over your food while you are eating. Do not talk while you have food in your mouth. And there are not two sets of manners, one set of manners for the princesses in Buckingham Palace and another set of manners for the Wellheisen concentration camp. <laughs> I can just imagine that. Here's what Mary Taylor is saying, what uh, Ms. Stark is saying to Mary Taylor. She's saying, look, you be who you are regardless of what's going on around you. You're going to be who you've been trained to be. You're going to rejoice. You're going to practice that. You're going to live it. You're going to live out that verb no matter what's happening around you. Well, they did sing. They sang Girl Scout songs like you and I would know. Day is done, gone the sun, from the sea, from the sky. All is well, safely rest. 
God is nigh. Can you imagine singing that every night before you went to bed in a concentration camp? As they marched from their first camp into Wellhausen, they sang a song from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and every and ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. So no matter the circumstance, in gladness and in woe, when your heart is broken and your heart is soaring, rejoice in the Lord. If you have that relationship, you can handle anything. Lord God, we confess that too often our hope, our spirits are tied to the circumstances around us rather than our relationship with you. Oh God, help us decide to have that attitude in which we rejoice regardless because we have you. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.